Welcome to twoquestions.tv. My guest today is Stephen Hoffman, and we're talking about successful startups. Welcome to twoquestions.tv. I'm Susan Barancini Mo. Joining me again today is Stephen Hoffman. He's the captain and CEO of Founderspace, one of the top incubators and accelerators in the world. He's been a serial entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, He's been an angel investor, mobile studio head, computer engineer, filmmaker, Hollywood TV exec, game designer, animator, and voice actor, basically a renaissance man. He's also the author of this book, Make Elephants, Make Elephants Fly, The Process of Radical Innovation. Hi, Steve. Welcome back to the show. Great to be here. It's so good to have you back. Thank you. I love it. <laughs> well, you're one of my favorites. <laughs> I want to be your favorite. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, as we discussed last time, the book is amazing and absolutely I think a must read for anyone thinking of starting a business and probably people who are in business. Uh, but, but last time we talked about failure and today I thought let's approach it from the other side. So what's the best thing someone can do in a startup to maximize their chance of success? That's an excellent question. It's a it, big question. <laughs> it's a big question because there's a lot you can do yeah. to maximize your chance of success. So the first thing I tell every founder to do, if you're doing a startup or if you're in a big corporation and you're putting together a team and you want to start a project and you want it to be successful, the team is what matters. Yes. The team is the most important thing because as the lead of the team, your, your number one job, if you had, can think of all the things you could possibly do, your number one job is to get the right people on that team. Yeah. And if you fail to do that, your project will most likely fail, no matter what you do. <laughs> because if you have the wrong people in the wrong roles, nothing gets done, it doesn't happen. And that's why investors in Silicon Valley always say, we invest in the team. Because they know the team can start off even with the wrong idea, yeah. but if they're a good team, they figure it out and it works. And if they're the wrong team, even if they start out with a brilliant idea, somehow they screw it up. <laughs> and, <they> just, <laughs> and, and it never goes, never goes anywhere. So the team is number one. The next thing you can do is your management style. Yeah. So uh, really good leaders, uh, they are focused on supporting their teams, not uh, driving their teams. Because if you get the right team members, and selecting team members is really hard. Like hiring people is like the hardest thing I ever did. <laughs> like figuring out who's good and who's, I mean, when you meet people, you know, their resume can look great. They can be from a great university. They could work at Google or Facebook. But really, that matters very little. Mm -hmm. What I found matters the most what have they actually done in their life? And did they take real ownership of that? Did they go all the way with it? Were they like the type of person when they say they'll do something, no matter what, they get it done? Yeah. Or are they the type of people who are, and, you, and it's, a lot of this is psychology, are they the type of people who are always uh, pinning uh, the fault of it not happening on something else? You know, mm -hmm. the market wasn't there, you know, the, the coders couldn't get it, you know, the customer, some, they're all, you can make up a million excuses, but the people you want on your team are ones, and they don't have to be people who are, were like the vice president of Google or whatever. Uh, they can be people who took a project at a low level, like a junior project manager, came up with the idea and just basically made it happen. Every, got everybody to buy in, got all the resources, so on and so forth, and made it happen. Or they're an engineer who is always starting projects at home because they're so passionate, right? They're like, they can't help it. They love doing projects and they not only start them, they see them through to completion. So they're playing with new technologies and trying different things all the time. Or it's a marketing person and that marketing person, like when you talk to them, they're like reading all the latest marketing blogs. They're like, they, they're like really interesting. They're always trying new things in marketing. Like, oh, well, what's this inbound marketing and how does this work? And you know, how, how can I get my viral coefficient up? And they have all these ideas and they can walk you through specific projects 
or campaigns that they launched and everything they did and what didn't work and what did work and explain to you why. Those are the people you want on your team because as soon as you get them on your team, you can actually just say, this is our goal, right? This is what we want to achieve. And you don't have to point out every step of the way to right. get there. Because where most CEOs fall is, you know, as soon as you're in the, the muck with them, like trying every step of the way, guiding them through, then you're not doing your job as a team leader, mm -hmm. which is your job should be bringing in more resources, growing the project, figuring out the, the big picture while they figure out the details. Yeah. And so if, you know, to build yourself to success, what you want to do as a leader is bring in team members so that you can literally hand it off to them and you don't have to be micromanaging every step of the way. You can actually just be going to them more like a mentor or advisor and saying, you know, why did you make this decision? Right. Is it, are we on the right path? And getting them to really uh, think deeply and chart the course themselves. Whereas you kind of course correct or give them feedback if they're not doing it exactly right. The other thing, uh, well, if you, well, I can keep going because this is a big question. It is, it is. I have a question about that. It's a sub question, so it doesn't count. But um, are those people, are there a lot of those people? Because those people sound like superstars, like everyone would want them on their team. How do you get those people? Oh, right. That is the challenge. So most people, when you're hiring, you give up too early. <laughs> it's a lot of work. You know, finding the right people is, like you say, it's not easy. And these people aren't everywhere. But especially if you're doing a startup or really innovative projects, that if you have something that everybody just does the same routine every day, mm -hmm. uh, you don't need superstars. You don't need people like this. But if you're doing something where you're pushing the limits, where you're trying to build something nobody else has built in the industry before, where you're trying to leapfrog your competitors and do something exponentially better, well, you better have a team like this because it's really hard. You're not yeah. going to get there without. So uh, a lot of people, a big mistake a lot of startup founders make is they dive into their project. They're like, I want to do this. I'm so excited. I got to get started. And then, you know, the first people they kind of, think of they put on their team yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. it could be an old friend from college it could be somebody from their last job it could be somebody they just met at a networking event the, don't do this don't do this <laughs> think about what you re the people you really admire the people you really think this person is going to do amazing things in their life and i just really want to work with this person i mm -hmm. those are the people you should bring on your team um, and take your time. Don't, you don't have to have, it's better to have fewer team members who are all exceptional than uh, grow your team really fast and fill it with mediocre people, especially at the beginning where you are setting the, the tone and the culture and everything else and you need to overcome that hurdle at the beginning of figuring out your product, launching your product, making it a success. Smaller, really capable teams are the answer. Mm. But there's much more. So I'll quickly go through some of the things you need okay. to do to make it a success. I won't take too long. But <laughs> you need to make sure uh, that what you're doing, you can win at. If you do not believe uh, you can be number one in the space you're in, don't do it. Honestly, and I'm not talking, oh, we're just enough. If I'm talking, if you're going to build a big business, if you're going to build the next Airbnb or Facebook or one of these big businesses, uh, you need to believe from the outset that you have something where you can be number one. If you can't, you've already lost because it just means you're going to be one amongst many. And it's really hard to grow a business where you don't have anything unique, where you don't have a huge competitive edge. So again, don't rush into it. Take your time building your team. Take your time with these people who are incredibly smart that you're, you're finding, uh, experimenting with a lot of different ideas. Once you figure out the right idea, things will go very fast. But until that point, it could take a long time. And if you jump, 
Just like if you jump on the first team members and grab whoever you know, just because they're available and you know them or you met them, uh, you don't want to jump on your first idea and say, oh my God, you know, yeah. this is all I could think of. So this is what I'm doing. And then you start building it. And before you know it, it's been, you know, six months and you've spent a lot of money. But the, if, if, if you've gone off in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter how hard you work. I have like a saying, you can work, you know, day and night incredibly hard on the wrong idea and it's still the wrong idea. Nothing's going to happen. If you're solving the wrong problem, you will get nowhere. So the most important thing is to make sure you are solving a real problem and on the right path. That's the, the next most important thing. And that means testing it. Some ideas are easy to test because it's very low cost to put out a prototype uh, or you know, a minimum viable product or a video and get feedback. Some ideas are really hard to test, like they're bigger ideas. Either way, you've gotta, fit, you've gotta get together as many smart people, both on your team as well as advisors, to go over these ideas with you and go deep on them. Unless you go further, like everybody, in uh, everybody in the industry usually stops at a certain point. Unless you go further than them, push beyond them to, uh, to get insights and, 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 and knowledge that they don't have, you cannot offer the market something that already doesn't exist. You cannot really innovate or really create something amazing. So uh, I'll stop there. But there's many more things you could do to be successful, but those, those are a few of the key ingredients at the very beginning. Those are really important. And so, and, and I think they're relevant to the next question I'm going to ask you. Um, I've been thinking about the, uh, you know, you and I talk about startups and, and I've been thinking about kind of the other side of the business lately, exit planning. And yeah. some of my, some of my clients are people who are starting to think about exiting their businesses, whether from a sale or passing the business on to the next generation. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, business owners don't actually seem to know that you don't wait until you're ready to exit to think about exit planning. Right. But I, I think it's a poor idea to think about starting a business with the idea of building something to sell only because I think it keeps you from solving problems in a really authentic and purposeful way. But I'm curious what you think about that. Do you think that it, it is a good idea or a bad idea to build a business with the idea you're building something to sell? A lot of, it depends how you define selling. Mm -hmm. So one way of looking at selling is we're gonna IPO. We're selling yeah. our shares. <laughs> so they, you know, every venture capitalist is building a business with the idea to sell. That's and that's why yeah. they have very uh, specific criteria. The business has to grow like into a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, it has to have that potential. Otherwise, IPOing usually doesn't make sense unless right. it's a very small market, right? But um, if you're a smaller business and you're building, building it to sell, it's really hard. It's hard to sell small businesses. Yeah. And this is what many founders don't, we, I always tell founders, the most successful entrepreneurs I see don't build it to sell. It doesn't mean if you build it to sell, you won't be successful. It just means that the type of person who builds the business because they are really passionate about it, because they really want to build something great, because they want to make a profitable, growing company that they care about, they have a much higher chance in the end of being acquired right. by somebody or IPO or whatever the path is. But if you're buying it and you just can't wait to get rid of it, you <laughs> usually you're not putting everything into it for it to really grow into something that anybody would want to buy. Right. And you're distracted. And you're distracted. Your priorities aren't there. Your priorities are just like, how can I flip this thing? You know, right. how can, how can I do the minimum amount of work as fast as possible to sell it? And if you're lucky, maybe you can do that. But in most cases you will fail. Now with companies, I, I work with a lot of companies and Entrepreneurs, the, most of the acquisition offers come 
when a company isn't looking to sell. They're just like focused on building and growing their business. And the business is growing, customers are happy, you know, they're getting a lot of press. And then one of their partners that they've been working with or somebody who has read about what they're doing approaches them, you know, and uh, offers to buy it. Those companies that actually go out and actually say, oh, now we've got to sell, now we've got to sell, often the only way to sell is at a, at a discount. It becomes a fire sale. And they're right. just like unloading it and they're not getting the value they should out of it. And a lot of times, you know, they're, they're unloading it for various reasons, either because, you know, that they missed a round of funding or the business isn't going where they thought they would, or, right. the, you know, there's usually some issue. And so if you want to sell your business, what I recommend is not to say, I'm going to go around and shop this business around, because, you know, to everybody. It usually People know, go, people hear. People like, <laughs> Why are you trying to sell it? Like, what's wrong? You know, yeah. like, yeah. You're, you're, you know, you're approaching me cold to buy your business. Like if you approach people cold to buy their business, your business, they're usually like, well, is there a problem? Why, right. if it's profitable, why don't you just stick with it? You know, well, aren't you happy? Um, so uh, what you, your best bet is if you want to sell your business is to do lots of relationship building with partners in your ecosystem, related businesses that are synergistic to yours. Right. Approach them, but not about selling about how can we help each other. That gets you on their radar so that if in their, and, and as you discuss with them, you can figure out if their strategic plans are to make acquisitions in the future. And you can make sure your business appears like one that they, you know, the criteria, you can figure out the criteria they have for making these acquisitions. And then you realistically know if it's a good match for them in the future. So. Trying to sell your business shouldn't be call, cold calling people or you know going I'm or putting a you know sign on the internet we're for sale you know it should <laughs> be relationship building with strategic partners in your sector that can benefit from what you're doing um, exactly. and and sometimes the bigger companies are better because of course you're going to get a better value the larger the acquirer um, and the and you also want to figure out what these uh, possible acquirers need and potentially steer your company in that direction. Right. So if they need certain technologies, um, you, maybe you should be developing these. If they need, if they're looking for rapid growth and that's their main criteria, well then if you're not growing rapidly, you're probably not a candidate. Mm -hmm. um, if they're like trying to build an ecosystem with different players providing different services or, or things like that, how do you fit into that ecosystem? Those are the questions you need to ask yourself. You, a lot of people will go to an investment bank, you know, to shop them around. It's, it's a tough one. It really only works if you're, you know, mature enough, you have real revenue, you're really growing. If you're early and you're smaller, usually it doesn't work. No, yeah, very interesting. Well, Steve, I love when you're on the show. You Thank are you. one of my favorites. Thank <laughs> you for joining me today. My pleasure, I loved it too. Would you like to do the after show? Absolutely. Yay. All right. Okay. Well, viewers, if you'd like to join us for the after show too, head on over to twoquestions.tv. That's where we're going right now. We're going to twoquestions.tv. That's our URL. It's the only place you can find the after show. Now, here's the book, Make Elephants Fly. You can get it in Amazon. We've got links down below in the show notes for today. So make sure you get your copy. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.